Greetings to you all today from Botswana. I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about uh, spiritual warfare, something that we as Christians really, uh, we may be engaged in more times than we realize. In truth, I mean, the scripture tells us that it is against uh, the devil and the other evil principalities that we fight continually. And uh, some of us are more aware of this than others. Uh, I would probably argue some are, you know, members of the body of Christ in this area. The Lord has elected for my wife and I uh, to be engaged somewhat in this area. And I just thought we'd share some of the, th the useful things that God has shown us about fighting the devil uh, from his word, uh, a little bit by experience. Uh, I'm just trying to make this uh, video reasonable, but I want it to be one video and not two. Remember that we have extensive scriptures in the description and other comments, uh, links. Uh, all scriptures, of course, are by are through the King James Bible. So let's begin. One of the things that I had learned about the devil, I was studying about my en enemy from years ago. I learned that he is very old. As I read in Genesis chapter 1, I was kind of surprised to see that there was really no mention there was no mention of the angels. There was no mention of the angelic host. What happens in Genesis 1 is, is it is a description of the creation of our world, that is the universe that we see, because it mentions two heavens, the heaven of the earth and the heaven of the sky, which would include outer space. But what it, what it doesn't include is the heaven of heavens or the third heaven where God dwells. And I have scripture references for that also. Uh, listed here, but this, but the third heaven, uh, second, second Corinthians 12 verse two, where Paul was caught up to the third heaven. So it only makes sense that if God was, is eternally existent, that his heaven where he, he was dwelling and, uh, the angelic host, all of those things were in, were in existence long before we were created. So that makes the devil very old and that makes him very smart. The older you get, the smarter you get. You should. And of course, in the flesh, we tend to deteriorate a little bit physically. But that wouldn't have been the case in the third heaven. We also see, a re we also see references to this that show us that uh, it was Lucifer, or the anointed cherub. This is before the fall, before he rebelled against God. We see this uh, in places like Job chapter 38, verses 4 to 7 where God is challenging Job. He said, were you here when I laid the foundations of the earth, when the sons of God shouted for joy? So you see the angelic host was there when God was, was creating the universe and they were shouting for joy. You can also read this from Ezekiel chapter 28. Uh, the description of the anointed cherub that covers says that he was, he was in Eden. That is, as the anointed cherub that covers, not in his fallen state. It was only later in the description in that section uh, where he was fallen. So you see that there was a period of time in which man and all angels, you know, lived in harmony. Uh, the Bible simply does not tell us exactly when uh, the heavenly host was created. Was it a billion years ago? Uh, you know, a thousand years before uh, the universe was created? We, we don't know. It also doesn't tell us exactly when uh, Lucifer rebelled against God. And then again, of course, also hell would have been created as a punishment for that rebellion. So hell wasn't in existence either in Genesis chapter one. God simply doesn't tell us when these things are. So indeed, when the Lord created uh, the heaven, the, uh, the heaven of the earth and the heaven of the sky and all of the animals and such that go with it, indeed, everything was very good because there was no devil and there was no hell. But this makes him a very old created being and he is very smart. Another thing to realize is that there are very many devils. Now the devil himself would be a limited being. Okay, God is omnipresent. He is everywhere at one time. He is aware of the things going on, but not the devil. Okay, the devil is one being and he can't see everything everywhere, but there are many devils. We don't even know how many. There was one account uh, from a person, a Howard Pittman, who was given a psych, and he said that there, there could be thousands of devils for every person on earth. 
We just don't know. But we see references to the fact that there are many in Scripture. And so this is something to consider. Now, I say this also, I just throw this out there. I've learned that the devil does not read minds. In other words, he does not know what you are thinking. Okay, but he doesn't have to. If you would take, if let's say that in uh, the spiritual realm, uh, two or three devils were assigned to you all the time. In other words, they were just watching you. If they were watching you all the time, day and night, they would know you pretty well. And they don't have to read your mind. They would know how you feel. They would know what, what excites you. They would know uh, what foods you like. Uh, they would know what makes you angry. They would know how to get to you, so to speak. And yes, of course, you're there talking to people. If you're on the phone or if you're talking in person, they are there listening. And so they would know you very well and they don't have to read your mind. But as long as we are in the body, uh, they cannot read our minds. And so uh, usually when it comes to those things, as I am in prayer, I usually simply cover it in prayer, you know, binding the devil in Jesus name or whatnot, but uh, our God is a, is a whole lot bigger than that. I don't want to intimidate anyone here, but I just say that we need to know our enemy. We need to know what he's capable of. And there are many out there who think, oh, no, the devil's nothing, oh, we're so strong over him, and this and that. Well, in Christ, yes, we are, uh, in the end, but he has allowed great leeway in trying us and tempting us, and we really are no match for him. We are no match for him without the Lord. And we must lean on the Lord, you know, with everything that we can uh, to escape these issues. And so I'd like to read a couple of scriptures here. Um, I'd like to read a couple of scriptures. One is from Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. This is just your fundamental, this is the uh, fundamental fall of Lucifer and naming him. This is the only place in scripture that names his pre-fallen name. That is Satan's pre-fallen name is Lucifer because he's not Lucifer anymore. He is Satan. He has fallen and he will be judged. How thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So you see that Satan is a very proud being, and he tries to instill this in mankind also. He did this with, with the woman in the Garden of Eden. He said, if you will eat the fruit, you will become like God knowing what is right and wrong. And this is a very important element. And so from this, we even see in Psalm 82, where briefly God is saying, I have said, ye are gods. What does he mean by this? I mean, you can see if you read the passage, I, you know, that ye, I have said, ye are gods, but you will die like men. You will fall like one of the princes. What he's saying is, you know, you act like God. You have control of your own will. You can decide what is right and wrong. He's not allowing it. I mean, this was a part of the rebellion against him in the Garden of Eden. But this is what this is what is being said. The devil is trying to make us follow in his footsteps in a very prideful way. But the other thing I want to take a little time for is he's described as the anointed cherub that covers in in uh, Ezekiel 28. So I just want to go through this. This is verse, these are verses 12 through 15 in Ezekiel 28. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, which we take to be, this is a description of the anointed cherub that, that uh, covers, because you can see from the description, it's not talking about a mere man. So apparently the enemy was inhabiting this king of Tyrus. Say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. What that had said to me when he seals up the sum is that this was like the sum total of all the best things that God could put in a, in a creation. He says that he is full of wisdom and great in beauty. And now you know he is a very old being. 
So this is just, these are just some of the characteristics that God is listing here. Thou hast been in Eden in the garden of God. That's what I told you about. Every precious stone was thy covering. And it lists the stones here, such as the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, emerald, also gold. What I see in this is that the devil is very honored when uh, there is a lot of gaudy jewelry being displayed by men or women these days. You, you know, it's, it's like this. I'm not sure that something modest isn't all right, but uh, some really indulge in these precious stones and metals. And you can see that this was a part of what the anointed cherub was, was doing. It says, also the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. In other words, the devil is a master of music. He knows how to orchestrate music. He knows how to get people excited. He was covering the throne of God and orchestrating the praise, directing it toward the Most High. In verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walk, walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So I just think that this is a very descriptive uh, biblical uh, passage it tells us because none of these things have have changed this is what god created lucifer with and he still has these things he never removed his anointing but his rebellion got him kicked him and a third of the angels kicked out of heaven so please bear with me i'm going to try to go through this well okay i'm going to go through some of these characteristics that i have seen in the enemy one of these characteristics that I see very much is that he likes to remain disguised. In other words, he doesn't want you to know that it is him doing whatever he is doing. So he will tend to work through ways that you might consider ordinary. For example, he could work through an animal. That is, an animal could be harassing you in some way. It could be an insect. It could be, I, I had it with a chicken. Uh, the chicken isn't evil, but you know, the devil was harassing him. Also through very young children. When parents are uh, thinking that their children, this is mostly under the age of one, they can't speak yet, and they usually cry. And so we've seen this a lot, that when a child is really carrying on, especially in church, where the devil really doesn't want things to be heard, uh, my wife and I will, will be kind of sensitive to that, and we hear the din of children rising up. And so we rebuke the devil, we bind him from working upon the children in Jesus' name. In this way, if there is anything that is of a true nature that is bothering the child, it can come through, but we don't want Satan harassing the child, pretending like it's something else. You see, a parent would know that their young child will cry, and so they won't know when the devil is harassing him or her. This is one of the ways Satan would try to disguise things. And so don't be afraid to bind the devil from working upon an animal, a person, a child, you're only binding the devil from working in Jesus' name. And this must be done out loud. Again, because the devils do not read minds. They can't read your mind, so they must hear it. Even like in church, when my wife and I would do it, it would be audible, but a low whisper. We're not disturbing anyone. And so you can imagine what that would be like. And I will tell you, even though it's true, theoretically, that it's something else, it's not the enemy at work, uh, as far as the children in church, it has never been that. It has always been the enemy working. And uh, sometimes for some reason, it has taken a few seconds, maybe like 10 seconds or so before things kick in. And then the din kind of subsides rather than just, you know, snaps off. I don't know why, but uh, it's God's power and he's in control so he can work the way he wants to. One of the great characteristics of, of Satan is, of course, we know he is a deceiver. And the way that he has his way with people, of course, some become possessed, some become nearly possessed, or they have a great leeway in a person's life in certain areas. Uh, so what the devil has to do is he has to deceive you into giving up your will. Because again, as I have referred to that, 
uh, the scripture says, ye are gods and whatnot. We still have control of our will in what we do. And so Satan will try to deceive us into giving up our will. Of course, if we're doing drugs or alcohol like that, we are laying down our ability to reason and the devil can move right in. And if you do enough of that, in time you may become possessed to where you really don't have of your own decision making. But remember, even though that's true, it won't always look crazy. Because if it were, you see, the devil doesn't want to draw attention to himself in that way. He wants to be able to get away with it. And if you know it's him, then you'll start praying against him. And he really doesn't want that. Can you understand what I'm saying? All warfare is based on deception from Sun Tzu in uh, The Art of War, Ch old Chinese philosopher. All warfare is based on deception. But when those devils are exposed, when the Lord has exposed them to you and you can see what's going on, that it's not just some kind of fleshly inconsistency, the devil will just kind of drop his pretenses and be much more open, at least with you, if not with everyone else. Again, he doesn't want opposition as the devil. He wants people not to think that it's him. And we have seen things so much today. We are so accustomed to this at the end of history that we really don't, uh, we don't think about it. It's just another weird behavior, you know. I, oh, it's not the devil. It's, it's just something else. Well, we have an example in this. One of the great examples that has taken me from Scripture is the example of Legion. When Jesus has his encounter with the devil Legion in the land of Gadarenes, and as far as that goes, you know, the people of the town were afraid when they saw the man with the legion had been delivered from the devil. He was sitting there. He wasn't naked anymore. He was in his right mind. And it says they were afraid because they had been with this so long they thought it was normal. And that's what happens. We get used to bad behavior. And so we start not thinking, oh, well, this isn't the devil. It's, it's something else. I know the scripture says it's the devil, but surely that just refers to the fact that the devil was behind the, the first sin and we can blame him from there. No, he is much more involved than that. He is much more continually involved, which is why uh, my prayers to cover this video with the blood of Jesus and to cover my wife and I with the blood of Jesus are going up because he will surely make some type of protest uh, against it. He doesn't like being exposed. Other things that I have learned from, from uh, the encounter with Legion. One of the things I learned is that the devils like to be effective in the world. Remember that the Legion, uh, the man with the Legion, the Legion of devils asked Jesus that they could go into the, to the swine, into the pigs. And of course, the pigs ran down the, the cliff. They were drowned in the sea. And then, then where did they go, right? And I think, well, why did, why did the, the, the devils do that? And the Lord had shown me it's because they're always trying to get trying to get their hands on things, always want to affect things, even if it doesn't seem directly spiritual. One of my neighbors who who was who definitely had his devils, I saw he was very much like this. He could not stand to be ca uh, caged in at home. He was always trying to be effective. He was always saying, oh, I'll work on your car. Oh, you have this problem, that problem. But any vehicles that he worked on. Uh, did not fare well. From everything I saw, he, did, he never fixed anything. He just wanted to get his hands on it and be effective. And yes, these things can bring curses with them just from the touch of these spirits. And so they're always just trying to have effect in this world. And uh, they hate it if they are caged in. So one of the things I often pray when I'm praying against evil spirits, uh, evil spirits associated with someone, I ask that the Lord will cage in those devils. He will cage them in. He will keep them from being effective. And I don't know why, but that phraseology in prayer has worked for me. It may be different for someone else, but uh, I mean, I see it over time. Again, the Lord has not blessed me to have such a, such a power. It would be his power anyway, to just be snap. Everything is just gone. But I do see the effects over time and he still gets the glory but I do hope and pray other people can see it so that they can learn well and be educated. Uh, something else I wanted to tell you about the encounter that Jesus had with the, with the legion of devils 
and this is consistent in each encounter. It's not the official part of the encounter, but before he got to Gadarenes, they were sailing on the sea. They crossed the Sea of Galilee to get there. Do you remember that there was a storm at sea that was really threatening the ship and the disciples were afraid? Well, guess what? The devil can cause those storms. I have every reason to believe that these devils were creating this storm to try to prevent the ship from getting there so that Jesus wouldn't be able to perform what he wanted to do. Now, I have seen this by testimony in a book, and I have also witnessed it in my own life, whereas the devil is bringing a violent storm when he is attempt when he is being come against in the name of Jesus. And so this is just something. I mean, the devil is very powerful. You know, we through Christ are more powerful than he, but let's not take that for granted. We still have to lean on him and call on his name. So in, in terms of this, in terms of the enemy being disguised, we know that one of his descriptives is that the Satan comes as an angel of light or his ministers come as ministers of righteousness. So they look good. They come in disguise, but hold everything up to the word of God to see how they fare against the word of God. That is going to be your criteria uh, for judging if they are good or if they are bad. Uh, for example, there was one person we knew on social media was boasting of some wealth that uh, she had just come across, boasting that God was blessing her and that this was something. But one of the scriptures, and at a point I stopped arguing because I already knew it was useless, but she used a scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 28. And I just took it because she, she was listing this. And from Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, it says, talks about God's blessings for those that are walking in him, those that are obeying his commandments. And I was trying to tell her that Satan also blesses with riches, and he is the God of this world. And the thing is, I happen to know that she is a liar, and she boasts in her lies, all of these things. And so by this, she doesn't belong to the Lord. She's not obeying the commandments. By this, I can tell that if anything seems to go well temporarily, it is not coming from the God of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. It is coming from the God of this world. Again, Satan comes as an angel of light. And you will remember from examples such as it is in Mark chapter 1. I have verses 23 and 39. Jesus was in the synagogues casting out devils. The synagogue would be a template, a pattern of the early church. So there were devils in the churches and Jesus was casting them out. Please don't think that the devil isn't going to invade uh, a church. I mean, he is everywhere and he is audacious. The audacity is just incredible. Remember that the devil offered Jesus the kingdoms of the world and their riches, their glory, if he would bow, if Jesus would bow down and worship him. Think of how audacious that is. He is going before his creator, telling him to worship him, and he will give him also what he's created and put it his and put in his head. And so this is just very much how, how the devil is. He's audacious. And yeah, he will be in your churches. Don't be afraid. If you're if you're still uh, set on going to church, please just you know, pray ahead of time, pray during the service, you know, bind the devil in Jesus' name. Just ask that the Lord will be working against those spirits. He has power over them, but don't take it for granted. But not only that, if you're not convinced of these things, the Lord may allow some things so that you are convinced uh, because he has some other type of realization he wants you to be in tune with. We know that Satan is a liar and the father of lies. This is kind of the example I just I was just referring to. This is from John chapter 8, verses 44. But it says first that he was a murderer from the beginning. Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. And so it, it shouldn't really surprise anyone when we see murderers or conspiracy theories. These people that have determined that the world should have no more than a, one half of a billion people in it when that would mean the death of seven and a half billion people. You say, who could, some people say, oh, that, that's crazy. No one would do that. Well, Satan would do that. And Jesus said, you are of your father, the, the devil, and the works of your father you will do. And he was a murderer from the beginning. And so this is a, 
a very sombering thought. So where you're seeing murder and killing, know that Satan is, is certainly at play in the world. Let's see what else we have here. Again, I had referred to the riches. This is from the temptation of Jesus in Luke chapter 4. But something else that the devil does there is when he's tempting Jesus, he uses scripture. Wow, if someone uses scripture, that must be good, right? No, not necessarily. You have to take all scripture in measure. Remember what we were told, what Paul was writing to Timothy. He said that, that study to show yourself approved, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, there is description in the Bible. There is a progression from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And most of the time when people are, are calling out false doctrines or trying to apply them to themselves, they are twisting something from Old Testament. The New Testament is usually very clear. But I dare say it is also clear in the Old Testament if you are taking the entire word of God and not just a scripture or two. But this is just a warning that even those deceiving that are in that are walking by the devil, I mean, they might use scripture, but there will be some other scripture that sets that one in order. So this is where it really pays to know the word of God. Also, I wanted to remind you about accursed objects. We read of this from Joshua chapter seven. There are objects that may have curses upon them. Some of them are obvious, some of them aren't. I don't want you to get too twisted up in this. Some may be very obvious, like a, a pentagram, which is an upside down star with a circle. You could see this. Uh, sometimes it's in a design that may be in jewelry. Try to stay away from that. Uh, but some things are not obvious. So please be quick to pray. Ask the Lord for discernment of what is or, or isn't. You can cover it with the blood of Jesus and it, won't, it will be neutralized. Uh, but if it is cursed and you need to get rid of it, try to burn it. Don't sell it by any means. If you can't burn it by some type of regulation or something, then throw it away in a very discreet way. Try to break it first so that it's of no use. But then throw it away in a discreet way so that no one will be like picking through the trash and find it uh, and just cover it again in prayer so that it won't do damage to anyone else. But again, I encourage you, don't be too hasty with this. Take it seriously, but be sure in the Lord, because in, in the end, you can't really tell, uh, you know, what it might be or what it might not be. Uh, so I leave that with the Holy Spirit, between you and the Holy Spirit. Something else I wanted to tell you is we are to rebuke and bind the devils in Jesus' name if we're dealing with them. Rebuke and bind them. We do not have conversations with them. When we read of this, when we read of this encounter with the Legion by Jesus, sometimes we there have been those that say, well, you know, he, he talked to the Legion. That is the only time anywhere in Scripture, anywhere in the New Testament, you are seeing Jesus or the disciples do this. Why? Because you can see from the Old Testament instruction, we are not to have conversations with devils. And I have scriptures listed for that also. So why did Jesus do it? Probably because he wanted us to see the nature of what he was dealing with. He wanted us to know that there are many devils. The devil was called legion, but it meant there were many. We read in another place about Mary Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. We also read Jesus saying that when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he wanders in dry places and then he returns to the place that he had been. He finds it empty and swept and he takes with him seven other spirits. So that's eight spirits uh, that are more wicked than he is. So you can see Jesus wanted us to know what we're dealing with without having to constantly show us. There's really no reason for that. And uh, he is a very merciful God. So don't talk to the devils because they love to put on a show and they are liars. So just bind them and rebuke them. Bind them from speaking. Rebuke them. Tell them to go where Jesus sends them in Jesus' name. Take that stand. I urge you. I would also say that sometimes in telling uh, the evidence of a spirit, there is irrational behavior. 
I can't tell you where to draw the line here. You have to have it before the Lord. But there will be irrational words spoken or irrational things done. Greatly irrational, and you can see the difference. For example, one of my neighbors that was uh, also taken with devils, uh, one time in a drunken rage, he was uh, setting off big explosives. I went over to kind of confront him about it to say, you know, please don't do that, or why are you doing this, or something. But before I got a word out, he was all over me in a spiritual way, putting down, you know, he was he was ripping me apart as if I had just told him to got to get saved. And I hadn't, you know, I hadn't said anything. So that was the devil's responding. But then in his drunken stupor, he says, I don't need to listen to your kind of religion. I'm a Christian. My dad's a pastor. He says this, okay. Uh, But two months later, he was drunken again. And he's, he's just saying, your God is a lie. Your God is a Jewish idol. So what sense does that make? The first part would have been, there have been many that have rebelled against uh, fathers that are pastors. That might have made sense. But the next time he's saying something else, which fully indicates that he was, you know, he had no Christianity. His father wasn't really a pastor. He's calling the God a Jewish idol, and it's a lie. So you can see that's entirely irrational. Both things happened while he was drunk. But what I submit to you is I say that the spirits had were much more able to be pronounced in what they were doing because he had given up his his ability to choose by drunkenness. And now you're seeing multiple spirits saying different things coming out of his mouth. That type of things, things that don't really make sense at all. But we see so much of that these days. People say, oh, who knows? It's just crazy. No, it's not just crazy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against some serious uh, evil principalities. I also want to mention that God does have some measure of restraint on these. I mean, he, he, all, he has all restraint. I'm not demeaning him at all. But when we read in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 and 8, you will see that what God is saying here is that the devils didn't even know what Jesus was doing when he died on the cross. He said, because if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It refers to them as the princes of this world. That is a reference to principalities. That's not, you know, the prince of Mesopotamia or anything else. That's the principalities. They sought to have Jesus killed and to get him out of the way. And, uh, but they didn't know what was going on. So have faith in your God because the devil is going to be limited and he always overplays his hand. God will hold, I've seen the Lord will hold the devils back. Even from the unsaved, he will hold back their works upon them or through them. But at a certain point, restraint will be lost. And that exposes the devils, and it ultimately leads to their fall before a true spirit-filled Christian. Uh, But those times can be pretty long in between. We have to persist in prayer and have faith. God has heard you, and he will answer in his own time and way. But we have this evidence again, God restrains. And I want you to take seriously, like Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18 on spiritual warfare. Most of you know that it's there. Please read it, pray about it, meditate on it. Why would the Lord give us nine verses, a section of nine verses in a row, unless this were important? It's very important. And so take it seriously and uh, prepare your armor for the spiritual battle. It has been of late that we have encountered these things again. We had a a pretty good deal of these in America, but now we're coming upon it again here in some unexpected ways. But I felt very compelled yesterday morning, even before things had had gone further, I was preparing this this video. And so please be encouraged. Uh, God is great, but please take this seriously. We need to embrace the Lord at all of his word. Remember again, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Please don't try to pick apart things. uh, Some you believe and some you don't. You either believe all of it or you don't believe any of it. Ask the Lord for help. He'll give it to you. And don't be afraid to speak in Jesus' name. It has great power. May God bless.